All right, we're going to call this finance committee meeting to order. Present are council members Cost, Bub, and Marmy, and setting in for Fraser is Rath, and setting in for Blake is Lebutus. Uh, first item on the agenda is a request for appropriation in the amount of $500. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a donation from the uh, uh, Bill and Sue Moore Fund. It's for flowers in front of City Hall. Motion. Motion by Bob, second by Costs. Any questions and or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Most motion passes 5-0. Next item on the agenda is a request for appropriation in the amount of $1,452.08. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, about six months ago, I was in chambers and we talked about uh, applying for an Ohio uh, tax uh, refund on fuel. And there was a company uh, by the name of J.P. Mueller who led us through that exercise. They showed us how to do it. And our arrangement was whatever they got, we would split with them. The total proceeds was $2,904.16. Our share is $1,452.08. That's a process we now know how to do and a process we will do on our own from years forward. Motion by Bob, second by cost. Any questions and or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes 5 0. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Uh, with that, this finance committee meeting stands adjourned. All right, we'll call the service committee meeting to order. Those present are myself, Rath, Cost, and Bob. Labuda sitting in for Mr. Blake, and Mr. Marmy sitting in for Mr. Wyoming. Up uh, first, we'll consider resolution number 18-43, authorizing and directing the Director of Public Service to negotiate and enter into a contract without competitive bidding for the purchase and installation of new high-efficiency street lighting through U.S. Committee's purchasing program. Mr. Rhodes, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a uh, representative from Hall of Fame, Mike Blaney, and I have John from Graybar. Uh, in the council chambers tonight. We're going to give a brief uh, presentation to council. <clears throat> what I'm asking for is the authority to enter into contract with them after the presentation. If you give me that authority, then Mr. Johnson will be back in two weeks to talk about the financing end of, of things. But uh, with the mayor's help we're, and with John and Mike, we're going to give you guys a short presentation on what we would like to do with some of our lights on the highway, on-ramp, off-ramp lights, and under uh, the bridge lights. We want to change them from high sodium lights to LED lights. There is a cost savings over a period of time. There's a savings not only at kilowatts that will be burnt, but there's also a savings in maintenance and repair. But I'm not going to get too far into it because I don't want to steal their thunder. How's that? Good. So John, Mike, you guys want to come up and start the presentation? This will come and answer you. Okay. And for some reason, you want that sent by the rest of the way. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Again, my name is John Hazelwood. I'm with Graybar Electric. Uh, we put together a program to help um, bring some efficiency to the city of Newark and I just want to give you an idea an overview of everybody involved in this particular project because it's not one uh, entity that's doing this. Graybar is the lead uh, uh, provider in this particular and to give you an idea Graybar is a fortune 500 company we've been around since 1869 based out of uh, St. Louis Missouri and we have branches all over the country to represent the lighting, electrical, comm data aspects that would go on to various institutions and uh, municipalities and uh, the people that basically run their operation. What we've proposed here, and I'm going to try to do an overview, the players that are involved in this particular program is number one, the U.S. Communities, which is a cooperative purchasing alliance that was actually vetted by the city of Kansas. Uh, we are one of the contract holders with this particular alliance and it gives the municipality or the government that's involved, uh, either nonprofits, governments, a national volume purchasing ability 
There are 39 particular contracts that are associated with this particular alliance, and it gives you the best value and also class um, manufacturers involved in all of the products and materials that are provided. We also, as one of the players in this particular uh, a proposal that uh, Mr. Rose is alluding to is that Halifane is one of the main partners in it. They've been around for 110 years. Uh, they're part of Acuity Brands. And one of the things that I think bring value to the city of Newark, and especially a lot of things in terms of future development with the city of Newark, is that Halifane has been involved. They're here. They're vet vested in terms of the interest and the lighting of the city. Uh, there's a lot of polls that you've, if you've probably walked by it, that are existing in uh, in the city here. Uh, so they are one of the players involved in this. Also, we also have engaged Tanko Lighting, which is a national firm focused solely on providing professional services for turnkey municipal uh, energy efficient street lighting conversions. And uh, you have the details about a little bit about their background, but also in addition to that, they're a partner for with us because of their their strengths and some of the things that they've done over the past several years. They're focused solely on the municipal lighting. They've done over 400,000 street light conversions throughout the country and they focus on turnkey projects throughout the nation. Uh, some of the projects that they have done uh, are some of the cities that you see here, uh, including Hawaii, uh, various different types of uh, aspects that you see uh, when it comes to lighting and put it, putting the, the right ingredients into lighting the city and making sure that it keeps the ambiance of that city and what their, um, their presen presentation to the community, if you will. I also put together, and these slides are also available individually, we can email you, but I wanted to point out a few things in this particular presentation that kind of show what the technology and it kind of a difference. You have a combination of street lights, what we would call high pressure sodium cobra heads, which is the top one that you see there. And the difference is if you have a 250 watt um, high pressure sodium and you convert that to LED, you see a difference of about a 77% savings and can convert to a, like a 2.7 year payback. When you look at architectural products or uh, what we would call architectural lighting, uh, decorative lighting that you would see in the downtown area. You also have these located in various places throughout the city. You see a little bit longer payback period, but there's still a significant savings in using light that, lighting like this. One of the main factors that we see that the municipal street lighting is about a 40% of the budget that goes into maintaining this particular type of technology. Here we go. A couple things on this particular slide that I wanted to kind of point out is that the lighting that you've seen that has gone on, your father's lighting, if you will, high pressure sodium being one of them, and not to point on anybody's age, but it's old, it has been around, but even when it, LED was introduced, it is a lot less expensive than today than what it was five years ago. And one of the things that we are also setting up uh, the city of Newark to be able to take advantage is the smart city aspect. And so when we are designing everything that is going on going forward in this particular project, it gives you the ability to be able to have smart controls on each, each one of these heads of the, uh, the LED heads that we've got. And you'll see examples, some of the, uh, the future things with controls is that you're able to be able to detect whether it's gunshots, uh, be able to kind of manipulate and understand traffic patterns and that type of thing. This is an example of a slide that shows the direct differences in high pressure sodium versus LEDs. It's about a 50% more in cost in maintaining those. Then you also have aspects of the maintenance involved in doing that of 40, 40 to 80% of wasted energy that is going on with high pressure sodiums. Uh, and when you look at LEDs, there's a, there's an array of examples that show in different cities how they've been able to save money producing or bringing LEDs into their street lighting. This slide will also show you a before and after of what 
uh, kind of a visual of what high pressure sodium does. It's a long burning, it's been a, an established technology. It produces that yellow light, it lights it up, but a lot of times you really cannot see what's what in that street. So you see the difference in after an LED conversion has been done, there's a clarity there. We have a picture that we showed in a particular street parking aspect where the, uh, a very much a safety factor when you're looking at a street, a, a car parked in the HPS arena, you could not tell what the car was, the license plates on it. When you put an LED conversion in it, the same picture shows you can actually see the car, the color of the car, and actually read the license plates on it. One of the things that we'll be doing in this particular project, we'll be doing an audit. The audit is going to basically take the existing inventory of all the lights that you've got that is owned by the city. We basically evaluate all of these different points, the distance of the pole, the height of the pole, uh, and also in the process of doing the establishing a baseline, but we'll also be able to take this and confirm the ROI, the payback and energy savings to the dollar, and also be able to take that information and apply for an AP rebate, which will also be going to the city in terms of this project as well. The audit report will go back to the service director's department, so he'll have an overlay on his existing GIS um, uh, software that shows all of the particular data and, and be able to reconcile not, not only what you've got, if there's a, a change of material, poles or whatnot, you have exactly a report that says this, all this information has been audited so you know exactly what you have. One of the things about the design aspect that uh, we're, you're able to take advantage of is that Halifane and, and Mike Blaney has been very much uh, involved in this project because Halifane fixtures are already here, uh, so there's a long-standing understanding of what's there, but the, the, the audit process will also confirm a lot of that information if there's been changes over the years, so you have appropriate data. Um, the next slide here is one of the things that we're outfitting the, the heads that are being changed in this particular focus project. We'll also have the ability to take advantage of the Rome system, which is already a part of the city's uh, uh, network. Uh, the, the system has already been purchased, it's already in existence. This will be able to expand in all the fixtures that are going to be putting in to be able to take advantage of the Rome system that's already here. The advantage of the Rome system, and uh, again, to get into details, you can get a copy of it, and we're definitely available to, to share more details about it. But one of the main things is on a maintenance factor. The service director's department can also take uh, pinpoint of every fixture in the inventory and if there is a problem or an outage or some aspect of that particular fixture, the service director can go directly to that <coughs> instead of dispatching trucks to find out where the problem is. This gives you an accurate, up-to-date, and intelligent way of controlling not only what's there but also pinpoint troubleshoots and problems that may exist in the future with the inventory of lights in the city. The last piece slide here is the financials that we've evaluated on a cursory to give you an overall. Here's what the savings would be. We're looking at an estimated annual savings of about uh, 399,000 in kilowatt hours in dollars and cents. It puts everything there even down uh, towards the bottom over a 10 year period. Uh, the grand total of savings over 20 years and then we're looking at a simple payback with maintenance and energy savings of about um, 8.23 years. Uh, and the project costs you see up on the top right of 364000 The incentive that we're looking to obtain from AEP is about a 33000 which shows you a net cost of the project. And uh, the, the overall project that shows the conversion of about 432 fixtures of your inventory and then everything that goes from there, the 98 wall packs, and then uh, I think if we understand the union, will be some, the union will be doing some of the installation on this as well. Uh, with that, I think that gives an overall cast of what this particular project entails. Uh, if there's any questions, Mr. Blaine and I are available to address if you'd like. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions, and, and I'm going to let whoever is appropriate to answer those questions answer them. Uh, 
Uh, are we replacing every light in the city? No. Or just a no. No, it's, it's, the, it's the highway lights, the on-ramps, the off-ramp lights, and under bridge lights. Jeff, this is a, a small version of what could be a bigger project. Uh, I would almost call this a test project. Let's see how this works. Let's get the energy audits in. Let's see if they work, and then maybe we can expand it at a later date to more. One of our biggest problems uh, that we find with street lighting is the way it is now. If they're burnt out, the only way we find out their burnout is by a constituent calling saying, hey, you've got a burnout, or by us sending our crews out at night to go to the poles and to go to the other areas. So what we identified is, uh, you know, the highway lights, the on-ramp, off-ramps, and the under underpass and under bridge lights as bigger lights. And if we like this and we like the way it looks, we might entertain a bigger project in some of the neighborhoods. If you go to different towns, like I was in Atlanta, in their lower fourth ward, they have changed all their street lights to LED lights. And it's like daylight. And there, there's ways that you can take these lights and focus them so they don't shine in people's windows. So the, the technology's there. What we're burning here in Newark is uh, yesteryear's technology. So the numbers that you showed are, are as far as costs and savings. Yes. Or an apples to apples comparison. We're talking about the number of lights that we're removing and replacing. Correct? Yes, one for one exchange on okay. the existing lights of uh, everything from 250 to 175 uh, high pressure sodiums, and we're doing one for one exchange and confirming you're not going to get any less, you'll get more light as a result of the conversion. Is there a volume discount on this? And I'm wondering if the reason I'm asking that is uh, if we're doing a project, we're doing a state route project, which is going to lead to another question. Um, is there a benefit to um, including Granville and Heath into this discussion? Uh, we, we haven't brought them into discussion at this point. Uh, we just have kind of focused into Newark. I can't speak to whether we would get a better discount or not. Why we selected uh, gray bars because of the, the state bids that they've been awarded and, and are allowed to do. And it is as we see it, our best pricing that we can get. The other thing that took us such a long time to get back to this project is we've met with the unions four and five times. Projects like this, if you have all the installation done, can raise grievances. So we've had to negotiate with the union probably no less than six to eight times on what lights they would be installing and what lights they would not be installing. We've got all that ironed out, and they're prepared to be a good partner in this also. When you say that, you're talking about the what union. lights the union would install and what yeah, lights what, 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 would install? What lights the union's going to install and what lights the contractors are going to install, yes. We've had to break those apart. Because the, the way the union looks at this is this is all union work. It's all union work. And uh, so we've had to sit down and we've had to uh, have several meetings with them. This is a project we want to do. The other concern was with the new technology, these lights don't burn out as much. The concern is that we might be putting people out of work because there's not going to be lights to change, things of that nature. What kind of lights does it, do the unions produce? They, they change all the highway lights, the bridge lights, the underpass lights. So, you know, when a highway light is out now, that's a union job. They dispatch, they block off the highway, and they go do that. But with this new technology, uh, they won't be doing that. Because we're talking strictly state routes for this project, is there an opportunity to get ODOT to participate and possibly pick up part of the cost? Well, in is that reasonable to no. ask? No, it's, it's, fair to, it's fair to ask. Or, they've never been responsible for the lighting. Yeah. That, that's, we, we pay those bills, Jeff, as, as you come okay. into the city. And if you, if you want a good uh, exercise to see the real difference, come in straight around 16, head east, look at the new Thornwood connector, and, and look at the LED lights there. And then as you get close to Country Club Drive, you will notice the yellow sodium lights. There's the real difference. There's the night and day difference that you'll see. All right. Do we have any other questions for any committee members? Huh? Any questions from the audience? Sir, come on up, state your name, address, 
for the record, I think you can have a seat and let me answer. Steven, uh, Stephen Smith, 237 Violet Court. Uh, I was wondering uh, what the, uh, how these are set for uh, issues like light pollution, dark skies issue, initiatives, and so forth. One of the reasons that Graybar has been involved in the lighting industry is we've addressed questions just like that. There's been questions about light pollution. These lights have also been deployed in California in a lot of areas where light pollution is a very strong factor. One example that I'd like to point out, and it kind of relates to your question when it comes to how are you preserving the, the landscape, the, the, uh, the natural habitat of animals when you're looking at lighting, because LED has certain aspects to it. It has a better spectrum than the older technology, number one. Number two is that we're putting light where it needs to be. LED has a factor that it's not just blowing light all over the place. It's a focused light. So you have an LED array that's focused down and spreading. So it's not lighting the trees up and everything else. So it's a very focused light. One of the things that we did, or our partners did, was in Hawaii. They had to produce lighting. And there was a very strong uh, push against bringing new technology because of the migration of turtles. When they had to address that there's certain light levels and what they call um, degrees of light that has to be produced. And if you put those lights in it, it's going to kind of disrupt that natural process of those animals. So they had to address that for the state of Hawaii, that are you going to change some of those dynamics? And they addressed all of that. Because the, the suppliers that we're working with, specifically Halifan, I bring them in as a partner because they understand the lighting technology. They understand the science that's involved in it. One of the aspects that um, Mr. Rhodes brought up is that when you saw in Atlanta, there's lights that's going down on the road on the sidewalks and not polluting into people's homes. And that is a very, very strong factor when we're looking at LED lighting because it's very directional. And so when we're looking at that, it's not going to disrupt the communities as you weigh, but it's going to give you the safety factor that you need. Mr. Frazier. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so 532 fixtures are in scope. Dave, is it, do we know what the total number of fixtures we have in the city is? Uh, I'd have to get that back. This is a very small fraction of that. And you have to, you have to understand what we pinpointed is systems that the, the city currently owns. And we pinpointed uh, highway lights, on-ramps, off-ramps, and underbridge lights. Um, these are lights the city owns, the city changes on. If you get into the neighborhoods where all of us live and you look at those neighborhood lights, the cities don't own those uh, lights. Those are owned by AEP. Gotcha. But you have to understand when one of those lights burn out, there's no sensors, there's nobody out there looking to turn that light back on. But because it's a monthly bill per light, the city pays whether that light burns or does not burn. So what we do through the traffic department is we dispatch personnel out uh, probably three to four times a year to go out at night and they ride different uh, wards of the city. They stop and burn out. They write down the, the number of the poll. We call it in and it's really not a cost effective way to, to light the city. And does AEP charge us back for replacing it too? Is that who all uh, no, they, they, they replace them. That's part of their service grant. But they don't go out. They, they don't send proactive. They're not, they're not proactive at all. That, that all changed with energy deregulation. And then this comprehensive GIS audit, does that include the whole city or just? No, what, it includes what we're currently proposing to do. Okay. And, and what it will do is it will show a payback on our investment. And then are we going to use that as a foundation for the rest well, of the city? Our, what I hope to do is to use this as a pilot project. Mm -hmm. And we've taken a lot of time and energy. And as I said a little earlier, we came into council um, many, many months ago with this original concept. And <coughs> we've negotiated with the unions. We've went through different uh, uh, project sizes and scopes. And this is kind of where we landed on the, the highway, the on-ramps, the off-ramps, the underbridge lights. Uh, to, to start as a pilot project. Mark, after this is in place and after about six months of audits, then we'll begin to look at other areas of the town and begin to look at, do we want to own these systems? Do we want to take them over from AEP?
do we want them to be able to talk to each other? This is all new technology that we should be thinking about. Uh, a, rough, a rough neighborhood light costs the city $20, $21 a month. We could probably cut that cost uh, somewhere down to significantly down, $8 to $9. I'll, I'll point out years ago when they changed the uh, traffic uh, bulbs and the street lights, uh, red, green, yellow, it used to cost the city about $89 a month for a traffic light. Now it costs the city about $29 a month. But as you look at a traffic light today, you can see those LED bulbs have been in there for a period of time because you begin to see little black spots in there when you look at them because there's so many different rays of light that come through them. The other question is what's the impact for the installation to traffic? Do we to traffic? Well, this is something we've worked, something we've worked with them on and it's something that we're probably going to change their hours. We're going to go to uh, 10 hour days, uh, 4 days a week when we begin to install these and they're going to have a certain number of lights per day they need to install and they've got goals that they <coughs> set with them. It's, it's going to be a very, very well uh, programmed uh, project. And are we shutting down a lane or two lanes to do uh, this? As they, as they do the highway, yes, they have to shut down the lane and it is, it is dangerous work and we're figuring what days they're going to work. Mm -hmm. we're going to, Take Based on traffic and hours. We're going to take a look at all that. All right, we'll move on to the Mark. next. Those are great questions, but yeah, not, not pertinent to whether we're going to pass this on to full council or not. Right. Mr. Mayor. Okay. We have about 10,000 lights in the city. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> was that your only comment? Yeah, well, I was going to say the other thing on that. So sodium lights last about 18 months, uh, bulb does. So we're out there regularly on the highway, shutting down lanes and replacing lights. These have a minimum of 30 plus years, I mean, and it really goes well beyond that. So anytime we've got a lane shut down and a bucket truck and a guy up in it, I cringe with the way traffic is today. So that this hopefully eliminates much of that. So that's all. Okay. Hi, uh, Rochelle Volan-Smith, 237 Violet Court. I was wondering whether these were compatible with um, use of solar collectors to um, save on electrical usage? Incompatible with solar? Solar, yeah. Very good question. When we look at the lighting industry, one of the things that you have to have capacity to be able to maintain the light levels. When you, if, you, if we were to light up, and there's certain countries, actually countries and some of the cities that they don't have the ability to have the infrastructure where you've got 277 volt, some places 480 volt here in the city, it makes more sense to take advantage of the current electrical usage that are there. Solar light, one of the, the things that's not really quite developed far enough is that you have to not only gain enough exposure to the sun, but you need to be able to store that so that you can continue to put the same amount of light out uh, into that, that LED array. And what happens is if we have gloomy days like Ohio has over a period of time, what happens is the storage of the solar light gets depleted and now you have no light. And so solar is also good in certain applications but not in your main street thoroughfares because of the type of capacity of solar array um, storage and, and capacity for those lights. Okay. Any other questions, questions for the audience? Uh, I will, uh, before I say this next one out, I will say that uh, Mr. Blake arrived shortly after the presentation started, so he'll be close to casting a vote in, in lieu of Mr. Levitis. Um, so I will entertain a motion to send this on to full council. So Motion by Bob. Seconded by Cost. Any further questions, comments, concerns from anyone? Seeing none, all those in favor of passing this on to council signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. And we on to council with a vote of five to zero. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate you coming and appreciate your attention and information. Next, we'll consider ordinance number 18-16, determining to proceed with the improvement of properties in the and abutting fairway estate subdivision 
and along Horns Hill Road by upgrading the existing sewer, the existing sanitary sewer system, installing a new gravity sewer system, and this necessary appurtenances there too, and declaring an emergency. Mr. Mr. Moore, Mr. Chair, yes, sir. If I may, um, I will abstain from this voting on this ordinance as I serve as the president of Fairway Estates Homeowners Association. So noted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for shedding some light on the subject. Mr. Morehead. Yes, uh, as I was before you a couple of weeks ago, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I won't say jumping the gun, but uh, pushing the schedule a little bit. Uh, this is the, assuming that the resolution uh, of intent is, is passed uh, later on tonight, um, that's on your docket. Um, this is the next step in the process, uh, is to pass a, a ordinance to proceed with the uh, improvement project for the assessment. And um, what will happen next after the, the resolution is passed tonight, um, we will send notice out to all the, the property owners of the estimated assessment amounts with the, with the construction costs. And uh, if we get no objection to that, uh, no formal objections filed, then um, the ordinance to proceed that you're considering now will be on track schedule-wise. However, if there are objections filed, I'll have to come back to you at council and ask for you to table that because uh, if there are objections filed, there will be some delays in the process. So. What I'm trying to do is, is push the schedule as much as possible to get the project out to bid and uh, under construction, yet this construction season, if all goes well, um, we could be bidding the project at the end of June uh, and opening bids in the beginning of July and hopefully getting under construction in August. Uh, but if objections are filed, that will delay the, the process somewhat. So not asking for an emergency or any ex expediting on this. Um, you'll have the first reading in, in uh, two weeks and then the passage of this ordinance in, in another two weeks. Okay. Actually, this does hold the emergency clause, which made me really nervous because you're gonna ask us to pass this on the council tonight. Uh, the we'll put it on the, on the voting, us voting on it on this fourth and it's only two weeks away and I'm not sure that's an ample time to notify and obtain objections should there be any. I think the intent of the emergency clause was that it would be effective as immediately when it was voted on. Uh, I, I saw a law person in here earlier. Yeah, I mean, if, if I could ask you a question. If, if, if this passes through normally today Mm -hmm. It would be held on the on the June fourth. Read the first time it held and held on June fourth. Read the second time and presumably passed on June eighteenth mm -hmm. without the emergency clause. When would that become an, when would that go into effect? Would it be June eighteenth? Thirty, 30 days, yeah. Thirty, 30 days, days afterward. afterward. Mm -hmm. If we waive the two. Okay, so we're gonna. Is it? Mr. Chair. It's very strange that we're going to put an emergency clause on this and then still do two readings. That's why I'm confused, Mr. Army. Yeah, you can. Well, that's why I'm asking the law director. And it sounds Where's like perhaps. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I? Can we table it in no. two weeks? Correct. Right. You, you've got one of two choices. If you don't want it to be presented until the next meeting after um, that which is the 18th, right? Is that the date you're shooting for, Brian? Well, yes, if it's, if it's passed on the 18th. And yes. effective then. And, and effective then, that's, it'll be, that's it'll, kind of the goal. Yeah, it'll be effective as soon as the mayor signs it after the 18th. So it could be the next morning. Correct. So if you want that, we can either table it tonight until the 4th, or we can pass it on tonight and then table it at our fourth meeting for the 18th. 
and that way it becomes effective the 18th. You have residents that have 30, you know, the time to do it if they want to object, if that's your goal. I, you know, I, I, I see either, either way. I mean, um, so if, or it's the fourth to we'll you, you, closer here, closer. you can read it on the fourth and then table it on the fourth to the eighteenth and mm -hmm. actually pass it on the eighteenth. Correct. When it, so following this procedure that I'm asking the legal procedure, mm -hmm. at what point in time is he allowed to send out notification to residents to be able to object to this before we pass and it? And I would defer to to Mr. Moorhead on that. The the okay. notices will go out after the passage of the resolution that's already on your agenda tonight. Tonight, okay. Yes. Perfect. So those notices will go out this coming week, hopefully, if you pass okay. this tonight, pass and the resolution right. tonight. And I'm sure you're very anxious to find out council's view on this. Correct. So my suggestion would be that we would entertain a motion and after we have any questions answered or, or debate here, that we entertain a motion to pass this out to full council tonight and then we table it on the 4th. So at least you'll know tonight whether this is going to go on the full council or not and whether you should proceed as if. Does anybody have an objection to that? Okay. Does anybody have any questions about the resolution of the table from the committee? Does anybody in the audience have any questions about this resolution? Does anybody on the committee want to make a motion? Motion. Motion by Norman. Second. Seconded by Claus. Any other questions, conversation, discussion about this resolution? Seeing none, all those in favor of passing this on to council for a vote, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Abstention, same sign. No, yes. Okay. So that will pass on to full council uh, with a vote of four to O to one. Okay. That was not as painful as it could have been. More painful than it probably should have been. <laughs> Up next. Thank you. Uh, to consider resolution number 18 46 adopting a statement indicating what services, if any, the City of Newark, Ohio will provide for approximately 0.576 acres, more or less, located in Newark Township territory, a territory proposed for expedited to annexation and declared an emergency. This is a light item into the agenda as well as the next two, I believe. That's three. Um, so we will not be voting on this tonight. We will be discussing this tonight, and then we will be passing it on to council. At roll 11 tonight, or roll 11 in two weeks. Two weeks. Roll 11 on the fourth, providing minority and majority leaders agree. Correct. Okay. So uh, who has anything to say about 18 46? Um, Brian and I, I guess, are here to talk about that one. This is an expedited um, annexation from the county. Uh, given the time constraints for it, we just got it on Thursday. I just got back in the office today. We realized that um, this has to go to the county by June 5th. Our next council meeting is not till the 4th. Um, so we were just trying to get this on your radar so that hopefully Rule 11 can be invoked on the 4th and we can get it to the county by the 5th. Okay. Any questions on this resolution from the committee? Questions from the audience? All right, seeing none, that will be held over until the 4th. Next, uh, consider resolution number 18-47, resolution regarding a buffer zone for the annexation of approximately 0.576 acres more or less located in Newark Township and declared an emergency. That also a late item, also will be held over and if I may, Mr. Chair, these are all related to the same set of circumstances, um, okay. all, all interrelated. So we've just okay. asked the same procedure for these other pieces of legislation okay. as well. I'm still going to read them individually, I understand. Of course. Yeah. I won't make you repeat that every time. <laughs> Appreciate it. 
appreciate that. Any questions on any of these, on, on this particular resolution? All right, that'll be held over to the fourth. Uh, ordinance 18-17, consenting to the annexation of certain territory, generally described as being approximately 0.57 acres or less located in Newark Township to the city of Newark, Ohio, declared an emergency of late item. Any questions or comments about this piece of legislation? Okay, ordinance number 18-18, ordinance objecting to the annexation of certain territory generally described as being 0.57 six acres more or less located in Newark Township to the city of Newark and declare an emergency late item. This will be held over as well. I do know that this is one of those well, for this, not that types of ordinances. So uh, I'm sure Mr. Sasson or, or yourself will be just will be scoring us on that procedure yep. uh -huh. on the fourth. Any questions on this piece of legislation from anybody? Seeing none, that'll be held over until the fourth. And that concludes the service committee meeting. And we will stay adjourned. Up next will be economic development. All right. We'll call the economic development committee to order. Those present are Frazier, Rath, Cost, Hall, and Lang. Uh, tonight on the agenda, we have the 2017 annual report for community and Mr. economic. Chair, Mr. Lang is not present. I said Rath, Cost, Hall, and oh, who's sitting in? Your chair. Who's sitting in? Mr. Lebutis. Mr. Labutis. Mr. Barmy. Anybody out there? Somebody Jeremy coming? Blake, would you like to sit in? I'm right here. Oh, <laughs> problem solved. Uh, so, Mr. Blake will sit in for Mr. Lake. Some wall here. <laughs> I just assumed he called your name. But you're already up here. So, Director Motter, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Um, appreciate the invite to come and come before the committee and talk a little bit about what goes on up on the fourth floor with community and economic development. I put a handout together for you, and it is divided up into two sections because we do have a community development portion and an economic development portion. Uh, ultimately, it's all funded by community development block grant funds. Um, if you weren't aware, community development block grant funds must be used to assist low to moderate income uh, residents in the city. So I'm just going to run down through some highlights for you of what, what we do upstairs with those funds. In 2017, our allocation was about just under $700,000. We expended just about $870,000 in CDBG funds, RLF funds, and reprogram funds during the year 2017. Big part of that 870 went to uh, the cemetery, retainer wall, and sidewalk and fencing project that was about 260,000 and then we used some of our what's called the HODAG funds housing uh, development action grant uh, to help Mr. Lehman on 112 West Main Street the old Newark High School building renovation we got about $300,000 into that so those are our two big expenditures for the year in, in that um, next bullet item we took in about $110,000 in repaid community development block grant funds from our RLF housing loans that was substantial. We can use those and put those back into service through our emergency repair program. Uh, we took in about 35,006 in repaid home RLF funds. We put those back into use primarily with the Habitat for Humanity new <coughs> homes projects. We're very limited to what we can use those home funds for, but it's a perfect match for the Habitat for Humanity program. Um, next, $47,533. Again, that HODAG or Housing Development Action Grant revenue, we're just, we're, we're just about in the last year of collections on that. And again, those funds are primarily going to help um, Mr. Lehman in that, uh, that uh, rehab program. And the reason we, we, we picked that project is because these HODAG funds had to be used, again, low to moderate income, had to be used for multifamily rental units. So we're again very, very limited, but a very good fit, and made that project feasible for, for, for that to happen in our city. Uh, next item, we took in about 18.5 and repaid lead hazard loans. You might recall back, some of you got a little history. Jeff, you certainly do. Uh, remember, we had about $3 million uh, lead hazard uh, abatement grant that the city administered, and in that program, we, we, we 
granted some of it, but there was also a repayment portion to it. And so that's the funds where those funds are originating from. 99% uh, of our CDBG activities did benefit the low to moderate income person, so we're very, very compliant. We're getting very good um, uh, auditing reports for how the program is being run upstairs on the fourth floor. So I think that's, that's good to know. We assisted about 12 homeowners with emergency minor home repairs this year. We did things like replacing furnaces that went out. If somebody had severe asthmatic or COPD breathing issues, we, we would help with air conditioning systems. We've helped with frozen pipes, um, repairs, water lines, sewer lines, uh, anything that, those of that nature that people just need help for, they can't afford to do themselves, but they do qualify in that low to moderate income range. Um, demolitions, we really just had one demolition on North Fifth Street. Uh, Y1, we've, been at, we've had quite a few, almost 80 demolitions in the last six years here. Uh, the reason being, uh, our department actually assisted to help write a grant for the Licking County Land Bank, uh, and they were awarded a $1.4 million grant that can be used just for residential demolitions throughout Licking County. And uh, Newark being having some of the oldest housing stock in the county, we're, we're getting probably the lion's share of those demolitions, as well as Buckeye Lake gets quite a few as well, a few in Pataska, a few in Johnstown, and so on. But um, so we really just had to use our CDBG funds, you know, for just one demolition. But that allows us to do a lot of other things that you're seeing on the list here. Um, 66 businesses were assisted by the city and the CIC. Whenever I get phone calls throughout the year of people inquiring about maybe doing business in the city of Newark, we, I generate a prospective business file folder. Uh, CIC, which is uh, administered by Fred Ernest, he does the same. And at the end of the year, for our accountability, we have to have an annual report that we have to do, we have to count for how we spent these CDBG funds. Uh, we, we do an aggregate of what, what we both uh, discuss with potential business owners, and that's the figure you see there. Next, uh, we did about 10 CDBG activities that resulted in about 462 low to moderate income persons um, being assisted through the local nonprofits and also our landlord tenant activity, which is really our fair housing program. And you can see below there the number of nonprofits that we work with uh, throughout the year St. Vincent de Paul, Salvation Army, Coalition for Care, New Beginnings, and so on. Um, I'm going to try and move along because we are getting close to our time to make the council meeting here tonight. But um, we also had 11 CDBG subrecipients, which leveraged a total of $817,000. Again, that's us helping to leverage those CDBG funds to all those nonprofits that you see listed above. Um, funded the cemetery, retainer wall, fence, and new sidewalk project. I mentioned that a little earlier. Uh, really a, a nice project at the gateway to our city. Uh, certainly as a beautification. It was also a safety issue. It was very difficult to mow the, that hillside. And so we, we, we killed several birds with that stone right there. And I, if you haven't been by it again, I hope you have a chance to go out and take a look. But that was done with CDBG funds. Um, the Fair Housing Program, again, we are responsible for that up on the fourth floor. Um, we had to go through a, an RFP process in 2017 to hire a new um, subcontractor to, to run this for us um, and we did ultimately hire Southeast Ohio Legal Services. They are right here on Locust Street so I think that's great. They're local, people can go right in, have a face-to-face -face conversation and get their, their, their issues taken care of. Um, but we did go through that process, we made the decision, we hired Southeast Legal and then we also created a Fair Housing Review Board which was one of the requirements through the fair housing program. So we, we established that this year. And number three, we did have a good rating uh, for our audit for fair housing. Uh, by the way, that's the best rating you can get. They don't go up to excellent and so forth. Good is as is, is, is good as they're gonna hand out to us. So we, we did well there. And the last bullet item, uh, records retention system. We, um, we got a lot of updating and improved our records retention system uh, up, up in the Department of Development, Community Development upstairs this past year. Some other grant awards that took place in 2017, you'll see a listing there, Ohio EPA Diesel Admission Grant, ODNR Grant, uh, Step Outside ODNR Grant, EMS Grant, Bulletproof Vest, which that's something Barbara does a really good job of every year, and don't have to mention the importance of that, and that Kevlar does break down, 
Uh, our, law, our safety director could probably comment on that a little bit more. So it's very important that we continue to get those grants and help our police department. Uh, Licking County Foundation grant um, came in this year, and um, some other ones that you see there, the JAG, Justice Assistance Grant, Public Safety Grants, um, are listed all down there. They total about $400,000. And that's over and above that $695,000 CDBG grant. So uh, we're working hard. That department, if you didn't know, is 100% funded by grants. Myself, Barbara, and Melissa, the three of us that, that administer that department, uh, do not receive any general tax revenue funds to pay our wages and benefits. So not only are we doing a lot of good things to bring money in for the city, but it also helps cover our expenses upstairs as well. Um, some other things that we're continuing on administering are the COPS grant that we brought in previously, a $250,000 grant there. The FEMA SAFER grant, which I know, Jeremy, you're very familiar with those, and you, I know you're a big advocate for those grants as well. So we continue administering that, about a $417,000 grant, and then a second one for another $470,000. So that is the end of my community development portion. Does anybody have any questions? On that portion of what we're doing upstairs. We'll move on to the next portion. We don't see okay. Anything. Very good. So the other side of this, uh, the economic development side upstairs. Um, I'm just going to list through a number of the programs that we administer up there. And the first one is called the Community Reinvestment Area, or CRAs. Um, participants and property owners and CRAs uh, apply for these to receive tax abatements. And it's tax abatements on any improvements that they do to their property. So any money they spend on those improvements can be abated back to them. It can be rehab, it can be new construction, and the program is structured to um, tax abate those 12 years for rehabs, 15 years for new construction. And you can see there we did about five applicants in 17. In 2017 we have 154 active properties still on our CRA list. Um, we have five CRAs uh, currently, although CRA number two has been expired, so we're really just administering four at this time. And you can see over the, over the conception of the CRA program here in the city of Newark, there's been 558 applications. So it's, uh, it's made a big difference in our community. Again, that stimulates investment and growth in the city of Newark. And I'm responsible for overseeing and administering, and we have to do, conduct an annual review on the CRAs. The tax incentive finance districts, there are six of those in the city. Uh, those provide tax revenues to finance public infrastructure improvements. And TIFs 1 and 2 are primarily in the DO Drive West area. As well, if you, we also administer uh, North 21st Street properties in that TIF 1 and 2. Uh, TIF area number 3 uh, comprises some properties on Mount Vernon and DO Drive on the east side. TIF number 4 is the Longaberger Basket property on East Main. TIF number five is River Road on the west end of town. Redwood Development constructed uh, several hundred apartments out there. And um, we're collecting TIF money there to do improvements, future improvements that we know, Jeff, that's your area, that we're going to need to do on River Road. Probably some left turn lanes and other improvements are going to be required as, as that continues to develop and we have more increased traffic on those streets. And TIF number six is our most recent uh, Project that's for the eight Evans and Baker Boulevard areas. Um, we also kind of call that the Kroger TIF, um, with Kroger coming in buying that property that used to be Myers, and all the money that they put into that, we are tiffing that on a 10-year, 75% TIF there again to do public improvements, which we hope to do the adjoining of the Baker and Evans Boulevard down the road. Next area is the Joint Economic Development Programs, or JEDs as they're called. Uh, these are created by uh, staff of the Economic Development Department a few years back. It uh, basically involves the city collecting and distributing the income tax revenues from these sites that are located out of the city. But the city was recruited basically because of their accounting system to take care of the accounting and the collection of these taxes and then dispersing those. So we administer what's called JEDZ-1. Uh, that's basically the Etna Corporate uh, Park in Etna Township. Basically, if you've been up there, it's everything on the north side of Route 40 comprises JEDZ-1. JEDZ-2 is on the south side of Route 40, and that is basically the Amazon Fulfillment Center that, that you're all familiar with now. And we take care of that. And the third is the Patasco Corporate Park in Patasco, and we also 
administer the, the collection and funding of that. Uh, next item, retention expansion is a big part of um, what we do upstairs. This basically focuses on supporting existing businesses within the city. Um, obviously it's very important. It's a whole lot easier to keep businesses than it is to go out and recruit and attract and bring, bring one in. So we work very hard at making sure we stay in touch with the businesses, see if their needs are being met through the city of Newark, and if there's anything further we can do to facilitate their stay and, and hopefully their, their success in the city of Newark. Um, under retention expansion, we do work with the Licking County Retention Expansion Task Force, which is run through Grow Licking County, as you can see in my notes there. Um, Grow is, is helping take a lead uh, on the entire county and also the municipalities. So we're kind of doing a, um, a joint economic development retention expansion for county and the Newark area. Um, Number three, the technical business assistance. We regularly get calls. Like you saw, we, we between CIC and myself, we serviced about 66 businesses this past year and constantly get calls. And I will do things like tell them of our CRA program for tax abatement if they want to take advantage of that. Tell them about TIFs, which could help do public improvements um, uh, for their businesses. We can do downtown revitalization projects as well. And then also people want to know about our zoning. They want to know about our water and our sewer services. They want to know about our police and fire and our parks and recreation, the amenities that make quality of life, you know, so important here in the city of Newark. So that's the, the R&E portion of things. We, uh, we take care of brownfields. Um, and uh, this obviously focuses on the remediation of contaminated properties, hopefully for the purpose of job creation and new developments and business growth. Uh, the first item is identifies the newer processing center. Um, that, that's really an exciting story to tell. That was a, a very contaminated brownfield site on the east end of town. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers came in and did some preliminary work to clean things up and get things prepped for additional remediation. Ultimately, the city got an additional grant, brownfield grant, where we capped off the site with, with new dirt, basically. We, there was some contaminated soil. We put two feet of fill on top of that. And it was graded on a 5% grade facing south to hopefully one day put a uh, solar array system out there to provide uh, electrical energy back to the city of Newark. And as you can see in the notes there, that was accomplished in 2017. The city partnered with AEP, uh, completed the installation of a one uh, megawatt solar array that now supplies Roger about 28% about right, Roger? Approximately? It's AEP on-site partners. AEP on-site partners. Thank you. Okay. Pre but uh, very successful program. Um, what is the crow flies? That solar array field is probably three quarter of a mile from the sewage treatment plant or so. But it's it's supplying power directly to uh, the sewage treatment plant, which if I recall is one of the largest energy users in the city of Newark because all the pumps and so forth out there. So a big plus, a big win. Uh, we took a brownfield site and now it's producing power for, for the city of Newark. Uh, there's some other things we got to do out there for semi-annual semi inspections and, and so forth, so we take care of that as well. Uh, the second item under brownfields is the former quality chemical site at 209 to 217 South 21st Street. You might know it better, it's, it's right to the left of or the south of PCA, Packaging Corporation of America, right there at the railroad tracks at 21st Street. And um, there's, a site, uh, there's a site there that needs some work, and we're continuing to see if we can work on a solution for that. Next item, number three, is the US EPA Community-Wide Hazardous Materials and Petroleum Assessment Grant. The key word there is assessment. These funds can be used to assess a property and see if there has been any history of, uh, of activities that would pro potentially provide uh, contaminants to that particular site. These grant monies can pay to have these, what they call phase one and phase two assessments done to determine exactly what the condition of the property is and what sort of a remediation program would need to be put together to, to properly remediate it. So we applied for and we received a grant in 2017. We got about $300,000 uh, to do both hazardous and petroleum assessments here in the city of Newark. And we're actively already working that grant as we speak. Uh, the next item, uh, that we do upstairs, downtown revitalization fund. 
Uh, this provides grants to downtown businesses and property owners for exterior building and site improvements. Um, we had to suspend the program in 2017. We had a very late release of funds. The federal government uh, did not get their budget in order, quite honestly, and that really pushed the timeline back for when they could do allocations of how much money, CDBG money, could be allocated to the cities, and ultimately when the funds could be released and put in our checkbooks to make, make the funds available. So we're, we're re -re regrouping. We're going to take those funds from last year and, and combine those with this year's funds and see if we can get some things done on facade improvements in the downtown area. Next is what is called the Certified Local Government Program. This was established by City Ordinance back in 2013. It allows local governments to identify, evaluate, register, and help to preserve historic properties in our cities. Uh, the CLG program is a step responsible for the designation of 112 West Main Street. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. Mr. Lehman owns that property and he is rehabbing it using our HODAG RLF funds. But before it, but he's also using uh, federal and state historic preservation tax credits. But he would not have had access to those state and federal historic preservation tax credits unless the property was designated historical. And believe it or not, it was outside of our historical district. And because it was outside of, we had to come up with a way to make application to have it designated as historical. This certified local government program allows us to do that. I've been told the normal course of action going through the Department of Interior, who administers the historic designations, it can take up to two years to get a property designated as historical. With a certified local government program, we, we accomplish that in about six months. So more of the speed of doing business than the speed of government sometimes. And that allowed him to continue on his project and get things moving forward there. So that's what we do with that. And then the last page, there's just some additional projects that we're involved with. Uh, the CIC, Community Improvement Corporation, Newark Development Partners. Uh, I serve on the board there uh, this past year. We did establish a special improvement district for downtown Newark, uh, which is helping already with our parking enforcement here downtown. It's also taking care of trash cleanup, and um, we're, we're seeing some results from that already. So very proud to be a part of that. We, I worked on the Vision Plan 2028, which is a long-range plan for the Newark, conducted through the CIC. And we help out on the Slice of Licking County. That's that really fun pizza party held on top of the parking garage uh, last summer and the summer before. Uh, next item, Licking County Land Bank. Um, the mayor is a board member. I'm his alternative, and I do attend all those meetings. Uh, but our department helped with that neighborhood initiative program. That's that $1.4 million grant to be used for residential demolitions, and that is being implemented. As you can see, we did about 21 demolitions in the city of Newark, and there is a whole list of additional properties identified uh, to take on as well. And the other item under Licking County Land Bank, uh, the demolition of 1100 Mount Vernon Road. That was that old Clark Abana gas station. It was been uh, really an eyesore at one of our main gateways of the city, and that finally was taken care of as a result of the land bank's efforts there. Uh, I'm active with the Downtown Newark Association. Uh, the mayor appointed me to be on the committee for World Heritage Designation uh, Committee for the Newark Heath and really Ohio Earthworks are three major sites. There's Heath and Newark and Licking County, Ross County and Warren County also have uh, earthworks um, in their locations. So we are working toward a World Heritage designation on that. Uh, we've gotten very involved with Habitat for Humanity over the last couple of years. We're doing new home programs, home repair programs, and they're putting a five-year initiative long-range plan together that, that I'm helping on as well. Uh, we were very involved, uh, myself and Dave Rhodes and the mayor, um, on solutions for Cherry Valley Lodge and also the Longer Burger Basket. Um, I participated in the Licking County Soil and Water Conservation 2017 Strategic Plan. Uh, we were approached by a company called Zagster. It's a bike rental program. They, were, they approached our area for Newark, OSUN, COTC, as well as Denison University to see if there was an interest there and if things would work financially to put a program together. It, it ultimately did not come to fruition, but we, we gave it a shot and we took a look at it. Um, and lastly, uh, I worked on obtaining a, what's called an urban setting, setting designation for 23 Sisal. Uh, the most recent use of 23 Sisal 
was by a company called Tenkate. Tenkate produced the armor uh, for Humvees. And um, uh, that, that production and plus previous um, uh, required that an OS, or through the Ohio EPA that the, the groundwater be tested up there, but because it's not used for potable or public use, um, they granted us an urban setting designation, which will help future property owners, because it is for sale right now. That's, that's going to be one of those hurdles that is now taken care of, and they have a clean property, and they can move, move forward on that. That's my report. And it was an excellent and concise re report, so thank you for the hard work. Is there any questions from the members of the committee? Got one really brief, or is there discussion about an entertainment district? I'm sorry, sorry, what was that, Jeff? Is there current discussion about an entertainment district? Are you talking about the Dora, the outside refreshment area? Yes. Um, there is discussion about that. I know taking on the CIC, for example. Okay. Um, I don't have anything more to add. Do you have something to add? There's a meeting uh, Wednesday morning that we're talking about that a little bit further. And the uh, CIC um, uh, is going to fund the cost of the consultant to give us advice on the best way to do a door. Any other yes. questions for the committee? Just, uh, Mark, thanks for coming tonight. I always appreciate your information working with you with several different committees. Um, could you, is the map for the CRAs, is that in a PDF format? Is that in a way you can email that out? Yes. I've always been curious to get a map of where all the CRAs are, if you wouldn't mind emailing that out. Absolutely, do it all the time. Yeah, thank you. Sure thing. Mr. Scott. Mark, this is really impressive. Thank, thank you so much for what you do, what you've done. You're welcome. Amazing. You're welcome. Hopefully we answered more questions than we created, which it sounds like maybe we did. We did. Any other questions or comments? All right. Next up is uh, Capital Improvement Committee. Thank you. We will call the uh, Capital Improvements Committee to order. The president is myself. Uh, Mr. Cost is in for uh, Jonathan Lang, uh, Mr. Labudis, Mr. Rath, Mr. Fennell. We have one item. Consider resolution number 1845, appropriating monies for the current expenses of the Municipal Corporate Corporation to expedite. Thank you, Madam Chair. What we're looking for is $20,000 out of capital improvements. The split on this dollar is going to go to two projects. Uh, we've been very involved with a renovation of Wells Park, and at Wells Park we're going to be adding a parking lot there. We've brought up the old lot. We've solved a lot of the water drainage issues there. We've upgraded the park. We've just done an incredible amount of improvements, and one of the last things we're going to do is redo the parking lot there. That will take up $16,000 of these funds I'm requesting. The City of Newark's uh, Street Department will be uh, putting installing the parking lot. The other $4,000 is I've entered into contract for the old Little Bear parking lot, why they're still looking for uh, uh, a potential new grocer. Uh, the city of Newark is going to open that up for public parking, additional parking in downtown area. Uh, we've got the lights reworking, but $4,000 to seal it, restripe it, and sign it saying public parking. So that's the split of the $20,000. Wonderful. Um are there any questions from the committee? Good motion. The second? Second. Mr. Lewis, the second. <coughs> All those in favor of, of sending on to full council? Aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. So it's moving on to full council. Right to zero. Um, 1845 will go on to full council. And thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we are adjourned. Council is in three minutes. <laughs>